you know, you've worked with a lot of different vocalists. Was there anything unique about how Lane approached recording vocals compared to some of the other artists you've worked with? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I feel like typically this, most of the singers, I mean, I'm, I'll lump all the, the, the grunge singers that I've worked with, it typically takes a lot of work. You know, we'll come in and they'll sing it multiple times and sometimes we'll have to go through and handpick between each takes. And where I felt like Lane, he was more so than the others, a performer. Like he, and, and I feel like it, it, it's kind of proof is in the pudding is when you go see them live, to, to me, again, this is my own opinion, Lane almost sings better a lot. When you hear them live, he sings better. Like there's more detail than the recordings have. So I feel like he was a true performer. So in the studio, he was like one or two takes. He'd go in and sing it, and if he was asked to sing it again, he'd get kind of grumpy. But I just think he knew what he was doing. He really, his voice was really trained, and he knew exactly what he was doing. Where I think some of the other singers that I've worked, well, in general, you know, like singing is, is an art form, you know, and it takes years and years to, to get to that level. And I'd say, you know, I think it's fair to say Eddie, when I worked with him, he was still new. He was a new singer. Eddie Vedder? Yeah. And and, and uh, same with the um, Blind Melons, uh, Shannon Hoon. He was a relatively, you know, hadn't spent a ton of time in the studio, where I think by the time I worked with Alice, um, Lane had sung, you know, for years and years in the studio. So his level of, of professionalism, you know, was just really, really high at that point. I remember Lane coming in with his four track. What was the song about, uh, hey? Oh, that's uh, a uh, Stay Away? I, yeah, no, stay, I keep, I stay Away. Yeah. I Stay Away, yeah. I yeah. believe my memory was that Lane showed up with the cassette tape of, of those vocals demoed with the harmonies and everything that he did at home, that I think he probably just did at home like that day. And he showed up and played it for us. You know, he's playing for Jerry probably. Yeah. So I assume that he wrote those lyrics and wrote those harmonies. Oh, another another quick memory was, yeah. that, you know, we didn't talk about Lane, his, the way that they did harmonies. I mean, because that's one of my, my favorite things about Alice is the way yeah, that they the did harmonies, their harmonies. Yeah. And then I think they were they had gotten so good at it. And, and Toby, the producer of, the, of Jar Flies, knew too. So Lane would lay down a vocal track and, and Toby would say, you got a harmony for that? And Lane was like, yeah, hit record. And then Jared Lane would add a harmony. And then Toby would say, you got another one? He said, yeah, hit record. He had another harmony. And I think, you know, on maybe on that song, we had like a stack of maybe four harmonies that he just went after another after another. And then, and then Toby's like, J Lane was like, yeah, I think that's it. And Toby's like, let's try one more. You got one more? He's like, I don't know. When you roll it. And then it was that fifth one. He'd find that really twisted harmony yeah. that a lot of the Alice has. It has just like that kind of fucked up harmony. And that, that was Lane just finding it on the spot, you know. It was sort of Toby pushing him, saying, let's let's just do one more. That's so cool. So you said he recorded some stuff on a cassette at home. Did you guys ever use any of those home recordings? No, the, I think we, yeah. those were just like examples. Yeah, we redid everything. You worked with uh, Alice in Chains on multiple records. Did uh, Lane's approach to vocals ever change at all record to record? Or was it always more or less the same type of approach? I think it got more so, like I was talking about, I think as, as the years went on, I, and, and you know, I worked on Jar of Flies, I worked on Sap, and I worked in the beginning of, I guess, which is now the dog record. And I guess what I saw was Lane just nailing it nearly instantly within one take. And, and if he was asked to do something again, he kind of got grumpy about it. So I, I would say he just got more, he just got better, you know, like mm -hmm. as the years went on, I felt like. Yeah. Some vocalists like to use specific mics and specific gear. Was there anything specific that, that Lane liked to use when he was recording his vocals? You know, I don't remember anything that he requested, but I do remember this was on the Jar of Flies album, which was produced by Toby Wright. I remember he, this is kind of a nerdy thing, I don't know, this is the... Yeah, no worries, it's cool enough, yeah. But he had rented, I think, uh, five or six microphones from Los Angeles, like a high-end microphone rental company. I Toby think, rented these mics? Yeah, for, for Lane. I think we set up about five different mics and had him sing a little bit on each mic, and we ended up with this vintage... It was probably a vintage tube U67 that just sounded killer. And we had a, uh, again, this is nerdy, but we had a, a LA2A comp tube compressor in the vocal booth, or in the control room that we were running his vo vocals through. And this is maybe a testament to how quick he worked, is we were just still getting a, a vocal sound set up. We had to get the dials just right to get the right level and all that stuff. And we hit record, and we were really just still testing everything. And he just got the tape. It was like... And I don't, unfortunately, I don't remember which song it was. I'd have to go back and listen to it, but it was off Jar of Flies. And I remember we set, he, the beginning of the song started soft. So we set our knobs to sort of the soft setting. And as the song 
throughout the song, he starts getting louder and starts screaming. And I remember the level was so hot. It was distorting the tube compressor and it was distorting the tape. And I remember sitting next to Toby and Toby was the engineer and you know, he was really responsible for it. I was like, oh, shoot, Toby, that, that distorted, it's distorted. Can we use that? And Toby just looks at me, he's like, that was gold. Does, does it matter? And so I'll, I'll have to uh, look up the song. I can't remember what song it was, but you can hear it distorting on the recording still. And that was the take. Uh-huh. It was like we were still just getting a, a sound set up and we got Damn. Yeah. So that, that's a good story of like how, wow. how he worked. His voice was powerful enough that it distorted a Yeah. <laughs> the and, and we just, that shows you how much we had to be on the ball around yeah. someone like Lane and Jerry too. It's like you just, they're so creative and it's like you just have to hit record. You know, yeah. anytime they're playing music, you hit record. Yeah, that's crazy. Did, did Lane ever blow out his voice when he was um, singing? No, I, Lane, he really knew what he was doing with his voice. Yeah. I mean, I've heard stories from live that he, yeah, uh, he really knew how to take care of his voice. And so, you know, you mentioned a little earlier that uh, Jerry Contrell, um, from your experience, was like the creative force in the band. Mm-hmm. So what was the relationship between Lane and uh, Jerry in that band? So again, this is just through my lens. And again, I was 19, 20, 21 at this point. I was just the house engineer here. So I really didn't know entirely how the music industry worked at that point. But my impression was Jerry was here 16 hours a day. He didn't leave the studio. He'd show up. It was coffee after coffee. And he was, he was, made, he was part of every single decision where I think Lane was spending a lot more time on the couch filling out breakfast <laughs> boxes <laughs> yeah. and was, was asked to come in to sing. Um, but there was so much happening outside the studio, you know, like I remember, and I don't know, you know, for the history books, I don't know where this fit in, but I remember Lane would show up, he had a cassette four track that he was home recording ideas for, and he would show up and play the ideas for, for the band and, and, you know, mostly Jerry and Toby yeah. probably. And that was later. So I think from what I understand about history, later Jerry Lane got more involved in the writing and the lyric process. And I think maybe that was what I was seeing was Lane doing writing at home and bringing ideas in to, to show Jerry. So I imagine there was a lot more like, you know, t- tug of war happening that I just didn't see. I, I mean, from my perspective, everyone got along. It, it seemed really easy, but I, I would say Lane was kind of um didn't have his head in the in the process the whole time you know he would come in and sing and then he would sort of disappear where jerry was very much part of every moment that got recorded that's very interesting yeah that, that was my impression so when it comes to L- lane's uh, lyrics you know a lot of some some of the in- engineers producers i've spoken to have said that sometimes vocalists they record they might just improv their lyrics on the spot with Lane, would you happen to know if he was very particular with his lyrics, or did he ever improvise at all? I don't know that he improvised at all. And I don't even know. From what I understood was that Jerry wrote most of the lyrics, and then later Lane started writing more. So, but I actually don't know. I mean, like I said, I think later during the Jar of Flies, I think Lane was writing more of his stuff because he was showing up with his cassette tape. Um, I didn't sense anyone improving any lyrics. Obviously, one of the biggest tragedies in you know, in grunge music and rock and roll in general was the passing of Lane Staley. Uh, when you heard that news, were you surprised by it? Or like, how was your reaction to that news? Well, I mean, that, unfortunately, like, that's happened way too many times here at Lennon Bridge. I mean, to go through the list, you know, uh, Andrew Wood, uh, Lane Staley, um, Shannon Hoon, uh, Chris Cornell, like, you know, it, it, it's kind of hard to talk about because it's so much of our history. It's a lot of my history. And these folks were just so brilliant, you know. And, and I, I guess I look at it like we wouldn't have that music had they not been suffering what they were suffering with that led them to do what they did. Whatever it was the decision or their lifestyle, whatever it was that brought them to an end, you know, their music represented that struggle. And... And that we all feel that like when we listen to that music, we feel their struggle. We have those same struggles, you know, so they in some ways, I just feel like, you know, they kind of struggled for us in a way and and put those emotions, you know, on record for us to like hear and know that we're not alone. So I just think that's that's really profound and it still lives on. I think it's still, you know, I love seeing a new generation kids in their 16, 17 year olds identifying with Alice in Chains, you know, that are now 20, you know, it's not their genre or age, 
you know, but they're, they're hearing something in that music that's meaningful because it is meaningful, you know, because that band and, and those people were struggling with life, just like, you know, we all struggle with life. Um, so sorry to circle back around to your question. Um, that's a great answer. Yeah. yeah Lane, uh, we all knew Lane was not doing well at that point. So it didn't come to a surprise. It didn't come to us in Seattle as a surprise. Um, I think it was sad. We all were disappointed that it was heading that way already. So I guess it wasn't a surprise. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I was heartbroken then and I'm still heartbroken, but I, but I love that he put that music down for us. You know, he left us a huge gift. Do you remember what your last interaction was with Lane? It was so long ago. I mean, it, uh, yeah. So probably my last interaction with Lane was, was here doing, well, I guess it probably would have been my last, my last strong memory was doing Jar of Flies. And unfortunately, I can't remember which song it was, but it was that distorted story where he was singing on the mic and it was distorted and clipping. And Toby was just like, that's it. We're keeping it. And I remember we asked Lane to re-sing something at one point and Lane was just like, nope. I'm not doing it. You got your take. And he walked out of the room. <laughs> like, <laughs> Friggin' rock star. That's, that's Lane, man. <laughs> and we went back and it was like, no, that was the take. You know, he knew. That's the way I'd like to remember yeah. Lane, yeah. Is there any one Alice in Chains song in particular that has a special meaning for you? Uh, well, I'd say Jar of Flies in general, just because I was here for the whole thing. It's funny, when you work on it, you, you develop your own, your own connection to each song. And I, I feel like I have my own unique experience of that record because I got to work on a lot of it. I was really young. It's kind of a foggy memory, but uh, I don't know. E each of those songs, I just, I guess I can remember little moments, you know, the band being around and, and I'm really thankful that I get to have, you know, and not everyone in the world gets to, you know, be in the room when uh, an album like that's being made. So I feel really blessed to get to associate to that record in a really special way. You know, Jerry Cantrell, he's really the creative force in that band and he's really, really intense. Jerry was very, very intense and he wasn't he wasn't unfriendly to me, but he also didn't go out of his way to, you know, get to know me in, in, in the slightest. He just like, I need coffee. I need this over here. I need this mic'd up and turn that up. And, but I, I understood he was, you know, that's kind of the, the, the way the studio works is like, you know, we're here a facility to, to facilitate their art. And so if, you know, if he's in intense space and needs to get his creative thing out, like I'm there to facilitate that, mm -hmm. um, you know, juxtapose Lane Staley, who, was the opposite. He was kind of more like Mike McCready. It's from my, through my 19, 20 year old eyes, it was like Lane Staley came in and he was really relaxed and he was really friendly. He asked about me. He asked about how long it worked here. And he told me a story about he was just like moving wood with his dad. And, and Lane would sit on the couch. And uh, I remember he would eat breakfast cereal. And one story where he, it was like, I don't remember, like some kind of puff cereal. Yeah. And on the back, it had like this, this uh, questionnaire that kids were supposed to fill out. And he filled it out. It was totally like disgusting. <laughs> there was something I saw him sticking something in his urethra. And he, and he put it up on the fridge when he was all done with it. So that was my impression of Lane. He was just like really fun loving and um, where, where Jerry was very intense and in getting down to work. And another, like my favorite, well, a really big impression on me of working with Alice was we were working on Sap and Sap was filled with a lot of more ballads because I knew Alice and Chains from um, Facelift, which was the rock record. Yeah. And so they're back here doing Sap and a lot of the songs, the first few songs I worked on with them were uh, more the ballads. And I remember he was, we were having to do a lot of takes over and over. And I remember asking Rick again, Rick Brosh was producing these sessions and I remember asking Rick, like, wow, it, it takes him a lot of work to get these takes and he's not even like shouting he's singing softly and and rick's like yeah he singing softer is, is actually harder typically for singers into the the screaming the belting thing like that's where lane lives like that's really easy for him we usually get that one take it's the singing soft part that takes a little more time so at that point i hadn't heard lane scream you know like his typical scream but i really was excited to and i don't know that we ever actually did any screaming vocals i guess later we did actually but on the sap the, where I sat, when I came in, sap was already mostly done. We were just finishing it up. But I remember Lane again was in the vocal booth and he walked in the control room and he was frustrated because he couldn't sing and he just yelled, he just yelled fuck at the top of his lungs. But it was like, it was that Lane yell. And that was the first moment I heard <laughs> Lane's voice, just not on mic, him just being frustrated, going, fuck. And I was like, whoa, that's the voice. There you should have recorded is. that, man. That yeah, would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. So that really, it just shook me, you know, it like rattled me to hear that voice 
in, in person in front of my face and, you know, and I was, I just love, I'm a huge Lane Staley fan. I just love his voice so much. So yeah, I'll, I'll always remember that moment. They would come and use a studio for uh, long, long hours and, and really get to work. And I, I remember being really nervous around, around those guys because of how intense they worked. Mm. Um, I kind of felt like com- compared to Pearl Jam when, when Alice came in, it was just music work. There wasn't a lot of downtime. So I remember being, having to really be on my ball as, a, as an engineer. So yeah, my relationship with Alice in Chains, kind of the same thing with Pearl Jam is that I, I was already, in fact, I had heard, I had known of Alice in Chains longer than Pearl Jam and I was a really huge fan of Alice in Chains as well. How would you compare, I mean, they're two to- totally different vocalists. How would you compare Eddie Vedder to Lane Staley? I think Eddie was still sort of finding his voice in, in the band. I mean, it was a new band and um, I, my sense was he was still finding his voice in general. And he was finding his voice in the band. So I think it took more work. You know, we did, my experience with recording Pearl Jam then was that Eddie had to do a lot of takes. We would do many takes, compile the best of. And I guess, I'm trying to think now, because I worked with them a couple times. It was all back in the day. But the second time they came back, he was, he knew more what he wanted. And I could see that progression where mm-hmm. he was. Um, and I've been around enough artists, you know, like I've gotten to work with Brandy Carlisle a lot over the years. And. Someone like her, I've worked with her when she was really young, and then I've worked with her a couple of times since she's toured the world. And when she's, after they tour the world, you know, musicians, you know, they just come back a, a new artist, really. So, hmm. you know, for example, with Brandy, the last time I worked with Brandy, she just, one take, it's done. You know, where yeah. when I first started working with her when she was really young, it was like kind of a struggle. So that was my impression with Eddie was that when I got to work with him, he was still figuring it out. And now later, and I don't know, I can listen to them play live. It's like, oh, he knows exactly what he was doing now. Yeah. Where I think Lane was already there. When I worked with Lane back in the day, he already knew exactly what he was doing. Huh. And that's why he could pull off. He was doing those takes often just in one take. So having worked with Pearl Jam, you know, for all these different projects and, you know, all throughout the years, is there any one memory in particular that stands out to you that means something special? Yeah. So the way my boss worked, Rick Prosher, he was working, he was producing the sessions that I was on. We did this B song, Dirty Frank, which was released, but it was kind of a, almost like a joke song. I think the band had just gotten off tour with Chili Peppers, so it kind of had this Chili Peppers influence. But Rick, the way Rick worked is he would... He would put in eight, 10 hours, but then allow the band to stay a little bit late with me. So he would kind of instruct the band, like, you know, stay a month, another couple more hours and work with Jonathan on whatever you guys want to work on. So I think we were recording Dirty Frank and Rick left me with the band. So now I'm engineering. It's just me and the band. And uh, I remember this song, Dirty Frank, was kind of about this this bus driver that like he was a cannibal <laughs> and uh eddie's singing about you know how he was eating people and i remember eddie there was in the back in the garage we had a sh- we have a shop a wood shop back there and we had a bunch of tools and eddie had this idea of wanting to sound like you know cutting bone or something so <laughs> we he asked if i could drag a microphone back into the the garage and we were starting to use little electric tools for the recording and um and then that night we had to mix it it was like had to be out like this was their last night in the studio so they're like, Jonathan, we got to mix the song. I'm like, cool, let's mix it. So I got to sit and, and mix the song, Dirty Frank, just with the band, just me and the band. And again, I was like 19 or 20 years old and, and mixing a song, you know, by Pearl Jam. And uh, it was pretty phenomenal. So when the song came out, you're, it was the B-side, when they back when they had B-sides, it was the B-side to Even Flow. Mm-hmm. And bless, bless their hearts, I know they tried, but uh, they the credits that they gave me on the record, if you look at Dirty Frank, it says, mixed by John. Spelt wrong, J O H N, and no last name. Ah, oh, damn, dude. <laughs> so it's, it's still a cool credit. <laughs> yeah. And that's a really good memory. I, I love that. was really exciting for me to get to, like, you know, I'm mixing a Pearl Jam song. It's that's happening. so cool. Did you ever run it by the guys? Hey, uh, FYI, you kind of got my credit wrong. No, I, I haven't. <laughs> well, I, I see Mike McCready now and again, um, but no, I wouldn't. No, it's, it's super cool. It's all, it's all for the history books now. Hey, no worries. That, well, it makes for a good story. Yeah, totally. Like I said, there were already, 10 was already out, and I think that they were, this is this is my interpretation, I, I don't know, you know, what the, the exact history is, you'd have to talk to them, but my impression was when I was working with them, they, they were preparing to do the video for Even Flow, so this was like their career was like, was launching and they knew it. So what I sensed was that they were doing a lot of business deals, so that we spent time recording, but it seemed like a good chunk of the time they were out in the lounge. Actually, it's, you can't see, but there's a rope swing hanging above us. Okay. And I remember Eddie would, would be swinging in this rope swing right here in Stone and Jeff, and they were just talking business. <laughs> <laughs> intensely. 
<laughs> saying that rope swing right there? Yeah, in fact, if you go, there's a picture out in the lounge of Jeff and Matt swinging on the rope swing, but when we took off the studio, we tied that thing up just for liability reasons. Really? Yeah. Are so there any photos? Find, of it? You can find photos on the web of, of them here, standing right here, swinging on that rope swing. Really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did uh, anything ever happen? Did anyone fall off or anything? Uh, lots of people fall off. Not, I don't remember Pearl Jam falling off, but I was at parties here where I, I was, the control room's over there, I was sitting in the control room, and this is soundproof. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I got the, the need lights off. But uh, I would hear a thud. In that room, which is soundproof, I'd look out and see someone like on the ground, they hit their head on the floor, but no one was like seriously hurt as far as I know. But really? Before I owned the studio. So, you know, my, my impression of Pearl Jam too, I, something that I caught that was, I think was a unique moment with Pearl Jam recording was, you know, at the time, from what I know, uh, Stone Gosser was the main songwriter. And, I, and I've seen the history movie, so I know that, you know, at one point, Eddie sort of stepped into songwriting. But what I think I've observed early on was uh, Eddie was in the vocal booth. So right behind me over there was the vocal booth mm-hmm. where the singer would sing. So Eddie was in there and he was, he didn't have a guitar in there. He was just singing, you know, and Stone and Mike had their guitars up here. And I remember at one point um, they were taking a break and Eddie wandered out, grabbed a guitar and dragged it into the vocal booth and was starting to like play and sing a song. And uh, it was his own thing. Vocal booth right there? Yeah. And uh, my impression was Stone seemed irritated like man what are you doing eddie like put that guitar down yeah you know he was kind of taking up some precious studio time to to record some ideas um and i didn't really know at the time one thing or the other but i but i did you know recognize eddie was having ideas you know yeah they they weren't necessarily uh welcomed by the rest of the band is, is was my impression you know, I have a great memory of Mike McCready. Uh, of, of, but like I said, the, the band was so focused on business. It was, they were, it was a really intense time. You know, they were very much down to business and they were constantly like, my impression was they were talking to their manager a lot. But Mike had this really like lightheartedness and he would walk in the control room and just, he'd introduce himself. Hey, I'm Mike McCready. Like, what's your name? John the Blum. Cool. How long you worked here? And he just got like, we got to know each other a little bit. And I thought, always thought that was really sweet. Yeah. So if that means Mike, maybe, I don't know if he was less involved with the business. Mm-hmm. He, he just seemed more lighthearted. So you're 19 years old. You're very young. You're working with this huge band. Was that intimidating at all for you? Yeah, it was because I was a fan, you know, so I, I knew where I was at. I knew these guys were, were going to be big. And in my mind, they already were big. So yeah, I was just a, 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 a bumbling fan at that point. In fact, I remember when uh, Stone Gosser walked in the studio and I think I was just so nervous. I called him Mike. And it's like, I knew which was which, you know, but yeah. I was like, Hey Mike, ah. I've done that a few times. I did that to, uh, Jeff Tate from Queens where I called, called him Chris, which was like the worst thing. Cause Chris DeGarmo wasn't in the band anymore, but yeah, yeah. I got to meet Jeff Tate from Queens, right? And the first thing I did was call him Chris. So yes, I get super nervous and excited. And to me, you know, they're just as big as rock stars as, as anybody else. And yeah. I'm just as big as a fan as anybody else. So. It's hilarious. And so when you do that accidental name mistake, what is usually the reaction? Do they care at all? Uh, everyone, everyone's cool. You know, that, that's kind of the unique thing about my position. And, you know, I know you've talked to other engineers as well, is that we're in a professional environment. So we get all this time to hang out, but we're working. So it's not like we don't have to be friends, but you, we end up spending, you know, hours and hours working together. And um, yeah, so it's professional, but it's also you get a good hang at, at the same time. So yeah. I don't feel like, you know, like these people weren't, weren't my friends, but I, I did get a good long chunk of time to hang out, watch them work. And I had to work, you know, we had to interact together and you kind of learn about personalities through, you know, who is, is you know, maybe more friendly at the time and stuff like that. Would you mind talking to me a little bit about your relationship with that band and how it started? Sure. Uh, so I got a job here at London Bridge Studio in 1990. I was 19 years old. And uh, the, at that point, so 1990, so Pearl Jam 10 was already out. And uh, I was just a huge fan at that point. And I didn't know the band, but I, you know, they, at that point, they hadn't broken yet. Um, they had broken in Seattle and that they were really popular in Seattle, but they hadn't had national success yet. They hadn't made a music video or anything like that. So they were just playing local shows around Seattle and creating a really big buzz. And um, I was already in the studio world, but got a job here uh, working with uh, the original owner, Rick Parasher. I was basically got hired to be his assistant engineer. 
which is kind of like gold, you know, yeah. because it was 1990 and, uh, you know, I'd seen Pearl Jam 10 had just been recorded here. Before that, Temple the Dog was recorded here. Before that, Mother Love Bone was recorded here. And a facelift, uh, Alice in Chains facelift was recorded here. So I was a huge fan of all that stuff. And I, I came in as an assistant engineer. And uh, yeah, one of the, I think within the first three, four months working here, uh, Pearl Jam came back in to record Dirty Frank was done here that I worked on and uh, uh, some of the single soundtrack, uh, State of Love and Trust, I think I worked on that a little bit. So again, it was out, 10 was already out, um, but I think they came in, I think Pearl Jam came in twice uh, early on for maybe like three, four days. Um, yeah, and I was, I was 19, 20 years old, just sort of observing what was going on and uh, yeah, it was pretty exciting. Were you involved at all with the Temple of the Dog record? I was not involved. Um, but I will say, because Rick Prosher produced that record, and, and that's a pure Rick record where he tracked and mixed that record, and I got to work with Rick for a decade, and, and he was my mentor. So I know, although I wasn't on the, the Temple record, but I just know exactly what he did, you know, because I got to learn his all his techniques. I know, I feel like I know intimately, like, how that process went. Was there anything about that process that sticks out to you from what Rick has told you? Well, Rick, Rick is an extraordinarily uh, talented producer and he's very light. Uh, he's not heavy handed, um, especially tech technically with, with the gears and engineer as well. It's, it's very natural. He, he doesn't do a lot of EQ or compression. He just gets really nice levels and he gets nice levels to tape. And um, when you listen, I feel like Temple of the Dog is a really great example of just a pure, uh, honest recording. I know they did it really fast. I think they did it in two weeks. When it comes to Temple of the Dog, obviously one of the things that stands out is the fact that Chris Cornell and Eddie Vedder were part of the same project. Did Rick ever talk to you about how he recorded those vocalists? Like, was there anything similar or different about their approach? Rick, technically, Rick never talked, but I know what, you know, I know, like, they used uh, um, a 47 FET, uh, which is on the bass drum mic down there. Uh, that was the vocal mic they used. And, no, it was done really simply. And I know lot, there's lots of like history, historic stories about, you know, because Chris wrote the record and really it was his music. And um, Eddie was up in town trying out for what was to be Pearl Jam. And there was no intention for him to sing on that record. But it was just that he was floating around the studio. And, and from what I heard was uh, Chris heard Eddie sing in the lounge and said, hey, man, why don't you try singing on this song? So it was really... Like that's, I, I like that story in that it was really just sort of dumb luck that the timing was such that Eddie was in town while they were here recording Temple and it just by chance he ended up on the record, you know? And I'd like to, I always like to think that that must have been a real true mo moment for Stone and Jeff to hear Eddie sing against Chris, you know, and, and sound great. So for, I gotta assume for Stone and Jeff in that moment, I was like, whoa, our guy, our guy sounds good. Because, you know, there wasn't even, it wasn't even a band yet. You know, yeah. Pearl Jam wasn't a band yet. So I mean, what, a, what, a, what a way to try out for a band is to show up to Seattle, sing on this legendary record, you know. The sound of that record is very indicative of this room. Like, there's no tricks happening. It's just what the band sounds like. The drums have been right there. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a little bit represents the, the, that whole grunge movement of, like, great music captured and really honestly and, and great performances. Did Rick ever tell you any either funny stories or interesting stories about Temple of the Dog that stick out to you? So I think famously, uh, what I heard, again, this is for the history books, is that Eddie flew up here to try out for Pearl Jam, but he didn't have a place to stay. So I'd heard he lived on the couch here in the control room for those two weeks. Really? I believe Rick mentioned that. I mean, it was a long time ago, but that sort of legend has it that Eddie lived here at the studio for those few weeks. Really? While he was up in town. Yeah. Was there any other point in time that he lived here? Not that I know, no. I think by the time... I worked with them. I'm sure he, he had a place at that point. So I was, you know, probably a good year or so later. Yeah, that's crazy. So he worked, he lived here for like two weeks. That's crazy. Uh, well, he, <laughs> he slept on the couch and we don't have the original couch. That was one of the first things we did when we took over the studio was the original couch was literally the original couch. And mind you, this studio has been open since 1985. So that couch was pretty gnarly. <laughs> apparently that was a couch that Eddie Vedder slept on. Where's that couch now? You guys just toss it? You know... When we took over the studio, everyone said, oh, you got to put that up on eBay. And, and uh, we wanted to, but we just wanted to get rid of it too. So we ended up throwing the dump. 
Jeez. So, I know, missed opportunity. It, Damn. That would be in a, it would be in a museum right Maybe now. Maybe for a so great photo shoot or something. You know what I mean? You gotta get Eddie sleeping on that thing. So here's the important question. Did Eddie pay rent when he was, uh, <laughs> when he was, uh, <laughs> I really? don't believe he did. <laughs> no worries. So another artist that, um, I've heard was here when they were homeless for a period was Alice in Chains. Did you ever hear about that? You know, there's such a history with Alice in Chains here at Lennon Bridge and, and I am young enough to not really know. Um, but what I've heard was both Lane and Jerry were in separate bands before they met. I know one was a band called Sleaze, and I don't remember what the other little band was. But here, here's my impression. Again, I, I don't know. This is how I've understood history was that um, Alice, the, group, the members in Alice started recording here simply because they lived in the North End. And there's not a lot of big studios in Seattle, so there's not a lot of options different studios for them to go and it just made sense for them to come here and I think they were just making demos this is you know, years before Alice in Chains but I think they were just making demos here with Rick because Rick owned the studio Rick Prosher and mm -hmm. he was an engineer so they were making demos with Rick Prosher but while they were doing that you know the band and Rick were developing a sound you know this is this is a new it was a new studio at the time and it's a new room and they're getting these they're developing these big drum tones on the demos you know so when Alice in Chains got signed they, it made the most amount of sense for them to come back up here and do the demos. The album demos were done here with Rick because they had a relationship with him and he was developing the sound. So I'd really like to think that that's where a lot of that sort of the, the Seattle sound, at least this tracks that the records that came out of London Bridge sort of like got seeded with Alice doing demos with Rick where they had a chance to like sort of develop these sounds. So by the time, you know, Facelift came, they came into the drums here. Rick didn't produce Facelift, but uh, Dave Jordan did. But you know, they were, this was kind of their home at that point. And, and again, too, because the Seattle has always been a tight knit yeah. music community. I think, you know, that Alice was having luck here with Rick Rosher. So Soundgarden came in, they did uh, Louder Than Love here, you know, and then, and then Pearl Jam came in and Love Bill. And so I think that kind of started a whole wave of, of those bands coming here knowing that they're going to get these big giant drum sounds. Did you have any relationship with Mother Love Bone at all? No, I mean, Mother Love Bone did their record here. Um, I, I mean, I know the drummer. I've met the drummer a handful of times. And besides that, and obviously Stone and Jeff, I've worked yeah, with yeah, him. Yeah, cool. yeah, no, I love that record. I, yeah, I mean, I, I I was a huge fan of that record before I even knew what Lennon Bridge was. You know, really. Yeah. So again, like for me to be here at nineteen, twenty years old, was like, you know, Rick. Again, he was my mentor, and uh, he had uh, an incredible career. You know, in the early nineties, he basically, you know, once Pearl Jam Ten was out, he was launched to like a list producer. So for me. Like the first three years I worked here, we did nothing but hit records. Like it was phenomenal. Like Candlebox came in, hit record. Blind Melon came in, hit record. Zach Wilde came in, Pride and Glory. That was, well, I don't know if that was a hit record, but it was a cool record. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and, and, you know, Pearl Jam came in and Alice came in. Rick was in the limelight there for, for really the first half of the 90s. He was, he was like the A-list producer so like he worked with Bon Jovi they didn't do that here but Rick went off somewhere else did Bon Jovi he did Nickelback up in Vancouver so he was like doing some of the biggest records of the day and then as the record industry changed you know a little away from the grunge scene uh Rick was doing less records basically and I think you know he started looking at retirement at, the, at some point you know he just did so well during that time period so the last half of the 90s he was kind of stepping back he wasn't working as much and uh you know, like I said, in 2006, me and my co-owner friend, Jeff Ott, who, who was an engineer as well, we took over the studio, we bought the studio from Rick and Raj. And then a few years later, Eric Lullivar, our third partner, bought in with us. Um, and Rick, uh, Rick kind of went into semi retirement. He was still producing a little bit now and again. And unfortunately, he passed away from a, a, a blood clot. Oh, that's sad. So it's very sad. He was a brilliant... Well, he's a brilliant person in, in, in many ways, but uh, I, I, I got to say, I learned most of what I know about music production from from Rick and watching, just watching him work, observing him work with bands like Alice in Chains and, and Pearl Jam. Yeah, well, God rest his soul. Hope he's in a better place now. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, thank you. So one of the other artists you work with that you mentioned that had a hit record was Blind Melon. How was it like working with them? So Blind Melon was, that was probably like, of all the records I did back in the day, that was probably the funnest for me because they're blind melons not from seattle so, and they're from the south and they're like the sweetest nice southern boys and they came in and they didn't know anybody in town and and uh immediately they just 
they kind of took me into their sort of world. And uh, again, because the way Rick Prosher works, Rick would set up days where he would work and then he'd leave for part of the day and, and put me in charge, which was like really, really amazing for, you know, most studio producers probably wouldn't work that way, but that's the way it works. So I ended up getting to do a lot of uh, engineering with uh, the Blind Melon folks and we just hung out. So that was one of the bands where I actually hung out with them and got to know them and, and we just became friends. And so, and, and, and for me, from my perspective too, uh, I, I didn't really get their music at first. I mean, they came in under the pretense that Shannon had sung with Guns N' Roses. So I was like, well, these guys don't really sound like Guns N' Roses, but I kind of see that they're, they're rock, but they kind of got this hippie jam thing. Mm -hmm. but it's not really grunge. I didn't quite get it, but I liked it. And so it was really kind of to my surprise what a huge hit they, I mean, I liked them. I just didn't get where it would fit in the industry, yeah. but you know, the clever folks at A&R figured out how to market them. And um, it was really cool to see their career just launch like that. So, you know, when you, when you mentioned right now, you became friendly with the band, right? Yeah. When you actually develop like a, a close personal relationship, is it more, I guess, gratifying when those records do really well compared to when you just kind of work professionally with somebody? That's a good question. I think it's great. Any success, you know, that, that you've been involved with, it feels really gratifying. Sure. Like, t t you know, I've sort of stayed friends with, with the Blind Mountain folks over the years a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's really cool. You know, it, it, it's kind of like... For, for me, I work here, you know, I don't, I'm not on tour, you know, I'm not seeing the rest of the world where mm -hmm. I spend all my time here. And, and what happens is, is like, I get to work with bands that are all over the world. So it, it's sort of like, it becomes my, um, these bands kind of become my, my, uh, what, what do you call them? I live vicariously through them in the sense that they're out in the, the rest of the world. Yeah. I'd say maybe Blind Mel is one of the bands that I got to um, sort of hear about their shenanigans on the road and, and hear about different cities that I, I'm not getting to visit. You know, Blind Melon, you mentioned Blind Melon is from the South. Why did they come up here to Seattle to record? Yeah, that's a great question. So, like I said, you know, Alice and, and Mother Love and all these bands had success here recording at London Bridge, mostly with Rick Rosher. So that a lot of bands started flocking here for that. But once Pearl Jam 10 became this like international success, you know, the way the record industry works is, you know, if you're a band in the South or wherever you are and you're hearing this new sound, you know, Pearl Jam 10, you just heard, you know, even flow for the first time. It, it sounds different. It sounds, you know, really cool and raw. You're going to look on the back of the album, either the album or the, or the CD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's going to say, you know, recorded in Seattle, Washington, you know, London Bridge Studio. And so I think Blind Melon was one of the first bands that uh, actively sought out Rick and London Bridge to record their record because they wanted to capture a bit of that sound. You know, they, I know they love the Temple record. I know they love the Pearl Jam record. And, and I specifically remember Blind Melon coming and saying, look, we want, we want that sound, but toned down. You know, we, we're not a grunge band, but we want that energy, but just toned down a little. Yeah. So when you listen to that Blind Melon record, uh, that's what it sounds like. You know, it's a, it's a band playing live but it's not, it doesn't have this giant, such a giant aggressive sound. The experience of recording um, in the studio versus live. And, and I've, I'm an artist as well, so I've, I've done both. And it's like, yeah, it's completely a different experience. And I, mean, I think that's a little bit of a, you know, fundamental struggle about making records is for bands that play live, you know. Um, and it's a conversation we have all the time here is like, how do you, take a band that loves playing live, you know, clubs or stadiums, or whatever, and capture that energy in a space like this. And I think fortunately this room, you know, has this sort of like magic sauce that, that makes the recording sound live. Um, so it comes relatively easy here, but I think that's, that's like the million dollar question is how do you capture that live feel when you're in front of, you know, hundred thousand, 10,000 people, how do you recreate that here in the studio? You know, where it's sort of like, a sterile environment where you're wearing headphones and there's not a thousand people screaming in front of you. You know, our philosophy, my philosophy is, is the band has to be really happy and comfortable. So we'll go to great lengths to make sure that, you know, everybody has what they want, their headphones sound killer. And, you know, and that's when, when the bands play the best is when they're in the moment and they're happy and they're connected with the other band members and um, they're just having fun. You can feel it. You can hear it when a band is, connected and they're they're oftentimes the best takes come when they're just they're lighthearted you know they just had lunch and everyone's happy and they're not it's not too serious you know it's funny you, 
you know, if you go listen to some of these like serious Alice in Chains songs or like a Pearl Jam song, you know, oftentimes those were tracked when they were like in a, in a good mood, you know, and it just, they were in the moment, you know, we just captured that moment. Thanks for watching guys. If you like what you see, make sure to subscribe for more. All the videos on this channel are original. I'm the one conducting all the interviews and editing all the videos together. So if you guys like what you see and you want to support, the best way to do so is honestly just to subscribe. Lots more to come.